Today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by NASDAQ. Michael, I was looking at the returns for the NASDAQ 100 ETF today. So year-to-date, it's down 34%. Not great. The, the returns for this thing, for this index, are unbelievable, though. So 2012, it was up 18%. 2013, it was up 37%. 2014, 19%. 2015, 9%. I've stopped right now. This is 7%, way too many you, 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 This 32. is too ambitious. You went back too far. Okay. I'm looking at the last 10 years. The worst return before this year was down 12 basis points. And so <laughs> even though this, this, index, this index is down 34% this year, over the last 10 years, it's still up over 335% or 16% annualized. Dang. Which is quite amazing, especially when you think how bad technology has done over the last, I don't know, 18 months or so. A lot of these stocks have gotten killed. One of the reasons that this index is down so bad is because it did so well coming into this year. Yeah. Anyway, if you want to learn more about the NASDAQ 100 index, go to nasdaq.com. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. Ben, can you see this? Yeah, it's a, it sounds like a thick piece of paper. It's fairly thick in size. Seems pretty standard. But what it is, it's a notice to appear. I've got a docket number. The people of the state of New York versus Michael H. Batnick. <laughs> For what? <laughs> so the first time... I took out my jet ski, uh, the new one this year, I got pulled over and I didn't have my boating safety certificate with me, which was very foolish. That's a no-no. So the Bay Constable pulls me over uh, and he said, uh, all right, send in, send in uh, proof of your certificate and you should be good to go. So I did that and uh, I don't know. I called, I, you know, this is full, my bad for waiting to the last minute, but I called the court where I'm in Boston right now, which we'll get to in a minute. I called the court, explained the situation. And they said, well, why are you taking legal advice from the Bay Constable? I said, I don't know. They told me to send in proof and I should be good. Turns out I'm not good. Uh, I'm not good. So I have to call back later and find out what the situation is and hope, hope hopefully they, I'm, I'm a fugitive basically. Does that mean they're going to break your kneecaps or take away your jet ski? I don't, I don't get it. What's the, what's the problem? I don't know. I don't, I don't know what to do, but I'm on the run from the law. I have a court date tomorrow that I can't make, so. You're on the lamb. What does that mean, by the way? On the lamb. I've never known. It sounds cool. Where did it come from? Wait, where did what come from? On the lamp? On the lamb. On the lamb? You've never heard that before? If you're on the run, you're on the lamb. Every movie says that about a fugitive. I'm on the lamb. Ah. Uh, no. I mean, call me Dr. Richard Kimball because I am on the run. So anyway, I can't be where I need to be because, Ben, you and I are in Boston. We're going to be talking to Fidelity. Or we're, we're doing a Fidelity event. Is that the right way to, to explain the situation? We're, we're taking the show on the road, Animal Spirits on the road, twice this week, actually. I'm going to meet you in Boston soon. I'm still in Michigan right now. And then we're going to Arkansas on Friday for another event with Acre Trader. And uh, Animal Spirits is going on the road. We'll, we'll see if this continues. But I'm going to be seeing a lot of you in the coming <laughs> days. Yeah. Uh, all right. So what a week in the market's been. What a week, what a month, what a year. You know, the, a lot of people will say occasionally, peep, there, there's people out there who, who don't like us. That's fine. Not every, we're not everyone's cup of tea. But occasionally people will say, well, you guys are long-term investors and you like buy and hold and all these things. Why do you pay so much attention to what's going on in the short term? And the reason for me... Besides that, it's just, it's part what, of our what job. a ludicrous thing to say. It is, it is pretty ludicrous. But the thing for me is this stuff is fascinating. Like watching what happens in the markets and the, the connection between the economy and the markets and data points in the market and the Fed in the markets. To me, if you just step back and say, yeah, take away the money losing part, it's just, it's interesting. What, what goes on if you're paying attention to this stuff day to day and how much it moves and how much things change and people's opinions. And I, I just think that. Paying attention to the markets is like endlessly fascinating because it's just this peer, you're peering into like human nature and human emotions constantly. It's the greatest game on earth. Uh, to that it end, is. on what day was this? This was Thursday. Josh and I were going to the city and I saw the staff from Sentiment Trader. So after Thursday, CPI came in hotter than hot, which we'll get to, and the market got creamed uh, immediately. So Sentiment Trader tweeted, and this might be a lot, but just stay with me for a second. The S&P 500 was on track to open lower by more than 
after six consecutive losses and at a 52-week low. Okay. An, uh, an open lower by more than 1%, six consecutive losses at a 52-week low. The only other two times that had happened uh, since they started tracking this in 1982 was one day, October 10th, 2008. Ben, last week I said like, you know, step back, maybe take a pause and, and appreciate or, or just recognize that we're living through history. Um, this is it. We are really, really in it. And it, it, it does feel like every day is a, it's the, the Michael Scott snip snap. It's plus two, minus two, plus three, minus three, plus four, oh, that whole thing back and forth, which a little tangent here, Gen X Seinfeld was the reference for everything that happened in life. Like you could, you could take every reference of something that happened in your life and bring it back to Seinfeld because they'd covered it. The office is that now for millennials. How's that? Even though you somehow never saw that show. Do I need to binge The Office? Will I like it? Is it possible to binge? Do I need to? Like the first, you have to watch the first three seasons. The, the first the first two seasons alone, at, at least. Uh, you could get, get through for the first three seasons and it's it's some of the best comedy ever. Yes. Okay. All right. And they're, um, they're very, they're like 20 minute episodes because they were on NBC for a half hour with commercials. By the way, all credit all credit to, to me for, for persevering through this podcast because Ben, not only can I not see you, because I'm at a hotel Wi-Fi, you're sounding like a robot, but we're going to power through. All right. Way to go. We're podcasting with one arm behind our back here. All right. This is from Nick Cole. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. I can't hear you, but I can still cut you off. To the point of this being the greatest game on earth. So the market was down. I don't remember what was down at the open. 3%, whatever it was. It was a lot. And the market finished up. It was one of the greatest reversals of all time. No? Yeah. It was basically a 5% off the lows or something. Finished up 3%. Then, of course, the next day it fell 3% again, and now it's up again 2%. I don't know. So this is from Nick Colas, who was on the Compounded Friends a couple weeks ago. If you didn't listen yet, definitely go give it a listen because he's he's very sharp. I've seen him give a few speeches over the years. He gave a whole speech for a CFA Institute uh, talk like 10 years ago I saw, and the whole speech was using Google Trends, and it was it was amazing. Such a smart guy. So he, he said- He's the best. The S&P is down tw- over 23% year-to-date, but nine single days make up that entire decline. Without them, in fact, the index would be up 9% year-to-date. So take away the nine worst days and stocks will be up 9%. And, and he said like all the, the worst days have come around basically the Fed talking or inflation data. This is, this is one of those stats where it's useless in terms of anything you can do with it, but it's still very interesting. Again. Why? Well, I don't know. It just be, are you going to miss those nine days miraculously and be up 9%? That's what I'm saying. You can't do anything with it. It just shows how crazy like... I don't know. We're almost all the way through the year. So what are there, 252 trading days in a year? So we've, we're 200 days into the year or whatever, and nine of the trading days make up the entire loss. Mm. You want to do something with that data? F- this is getting very difficult. Is it? It, se- it seems fine on my end. So because this keeps going on longer and longer, it seems harder and harder to f- figure out like what is going to be the catalyst for a bottom. And I did some research on this just to kind of show how difficult it can be to actually call a bottom. So I looked at a bunch of different fundamentals, 10-year treasury yields, CAPE ratios for valuations, inflation rate and dividend yields, going back to World War II. And also, just side note, every time I do a chart going back to World War II, someone says, why do you include the 30s? And I just didn't want to. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's way messier going back to the 30s. And I think... I mean, the Great Depression, could that happen again? I don't know. Probably not, but maybe. But still, that that period was just such a different period. And I look at, like, either post-1960 or post-World War II as modern financial history. Anyway. I'm, I'm with you. My whole thing is you can't use fundamentals to pick a bottom. If you look at the fundamentals, it doesn't tell you anything. Sometimes it happens bot- stocks bottom with higher yields, lower yields, higher valuations, lower valuations. I mean, in 2002, stocks bottomed at a 22 cape ratio. It was, it was still pretty high. Same thing in 2020, I guess. High inflation, low inflation, high dividend yields, low dividend yields. There's no fundamental. So the thing is, okay, how do you pick a bottom? And the only thing is, it's price, right? The only thing that can tell you if it's a bottom is price. The problem is, every time price goes up during a bear market, you think it's a bear market rally. So even price could lie to you. So there's nothing, right? There's, there's no signal I think you could look at that you could say, if you check these 10 boxes, stocks bottomed. Well, there's there's definitely no no silver bullet, that's for sure. One of these rallies will mark the bottom, that's for sure. 
We just can't right. know which one until it's, you know, until after the but fact. But, like, the, the Captain Obvious thing is price will tell you when stocks have bottomed because when stocks start going up and they get in an uptrend, that's when stocks have bottomed. But you won't believe price right away. You won't. I mean, listen, it was at a short-term bottom. You could you could easily make the case. We got hotter than expected CPI. You had a monster uh, washout of a day. And then the rally uh, finished at the highs. And so it's just going to be something that's that's – uninspiring and unexciting and not, not scientific or mathematical. There's just, if you were going to sell, if you were going to sell, you would have sold. And, and I there's just no, and there's just no more sellers. I, I went down some sort of financial YouTube rabbit hole last week and somehow I stumbled across uh, financial media from March 9th, 2009. And it was the, the day of the bottom. And it was going through like Warren Buffett was on talking about how it's just been a financial calamity and everything fell off a cliff. And everything was negative and negative. And there wasn't anything that day that led you to think, this is it. The bottom is here. It's the worst has passed us and the stock market is moving on. That's the thing. There's not going to be like a headline that is going to tell you when this happens. I guess it could be an inflation print or something. You could you could talk yourself into that this time around maybe or the, or the Fed actually backing off a little bit. But there, there are no – they don't ring a bell at the top and they don't do the same at the bottom. The reason why – like listen, if if, if – if we weren't in the situation we were in with the Fed actively trying to destroy demand um, and a recession probably looming, then you could have easily said, listen, like you could have taken a stab that that Thursday was the bottom, just given price action, sentiment, wash out, you know. But I'm still waiting to see the reaction to the data turning, uh, to the data softening. And is the market going to rally on that? I don't know. We'll see. Right. How how long would bad news be good news, and how long does it take to turn into bad news again? Yeah, and exactly. Then- so you could you could see you could see sort of bad news be met with good news, like okay, the Fed the Fed did enough; they're going to take their foot off the brake, um, and then you get some sort of relief rally. But then investors start to react to the bad news just being bad news. I mean, who knows? Yes, I, I still have trouble wrapping my mind around the the number of people who who are still sort of, it seems like, I mean, maybe to be an economist, you have to be sort of detached from emotions. And that's the kind of person who becomes an economist. But just people who are are saying, like, we need this bad news to happen, to move on. And I just, I can't, I can't wrap my mind around having that be your thought process right now. Rooting for bad news, bad economic news, and other people who lose their job. I can't, I can't get to that place ever. Well, there's a difference between rooting for it and thinking that it's it's an inevitability and that you need that to happen in order for us to get past this. Right. But but do we need that to happen to get past this? That that's my big question. I know everyone a lot of people think we have to have that. We have to have the unemployment rate go up to slow demand. And my question is just do we do we really because what what really caused prices to rise? It was government spending in the pandemic. Two mm-hmm. things that workers had nothing to do with. Right. So I don't know why we all of a sudden have to blame workers for – anyway. Wait. I feel like this is a non sequitur. Uh. Because, because workers – so, all right. I, I was going to get into this later, but let's talk about it now. I, oh, let's I, do it. All right. Let's go down to – it's past the inflation stuff. All right. So here's the thing. Everyone blames the government and the Fed and now workers for inflation for somehow. Obviously, I know they're not really blaming workers, but it's like we need to bring wages down because wages are too high. And if wages are sticky, they'll stay higher. Uh, why aren't businesses getting more blame now that like gas prices have come down and commodities have come down? How come no one's going after the corporations? I'm not saying corp- it's the corporation's <laughs> fault that this happened. No, listen. So Jeremy Siegel was on CNBC this morning. I listened to him again. And he said, Wage growth, everyone keeps pointing out wage growth is slower than inflation, right? Because you're saying, yes, right. wages are growing, but it's slower. So how could wages be the main problem if it's growing slower than inflation? Guess who's, t- guess who's picking up the slack there? Corporations. So Edyard Denny has the profit margins. Profit margins remain at all-time highs for S&P 500 companies. How is that possible if costs are going up for them? Because they're the ones who are benefiting from this. Why aren't the corporations taking more blame for inflation staying here longer than it otherwise would have? I think more people are getting blamed. I'm not saying this is a corporation's fault. They're taking advantage of this environment, though. So here's my, like, MMT, Ben is the economic czar of the world. If we have inflation go higher in the future, well, instead of raising taxes on people or trying to put people out of work, raise taxes on corporations. Thoughts? 
CPI goes above 5% annually, businesses get taxed more. What would that do? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> I'm saying if, if margins are still at all-time highs and we're, everyone's blaming workers for this, uh, doesn't it seem like corporations are the one who are taking the least amount of brunt of all this stuff? In that's terms of fair, yes, fair point. That, that, that's all I'm saying. That that's I'm, it may sound like a straw man. Ben, uh, I was talking when we were t- so we had uh, Bob Pisani and Kyla Skyland, Kyla Scanlon, excuse me, on the on uh, the compound and friends this week, and somebody made a comment about us being out of the woods, and I said we're never out of the woods. We're always in the woods, right? Like it's always. We're always either uh, it's it's boom or bust or somewhere in between. So I was reminded of of that. I was watching that movie Vengeance over the weekend, the hundred percent movie. Thoughts? Uh, I didn't finish it. Um, okay. So I will give you my thoughts. But they're in, they're in Texas talking about uh, it's an oil town, and they're talking about it's always either a boom or a bust. And and uh, so the guy said to him, "Oh, where are you now?" And he goes, "We're somewhere in between." Yeah. Right. <laughs> That that is that that's what this whole century. I feel like that's, that's the economy. It's either it's either we're in a recession or a recession is coming, or we're coming out of a recession. Like it's yes. always freaking something. All right. Speaking of busts, uh, I looked at Arc last week again. We were talking about this on Slack. Arc is now, as of last week, it was down seventy eight percent. Like it was a new all time low. At the peak in February twenty twenty one, this is when Arc was doing its best. It was outperforming the S and P by more than six hundred percent in total Overall from inception. Frame. From okay. some inception. So this it wow. goes back to like the end of 2014. Okay. Now I look assume at it's it. underperforming? Now it's underperforming since inception by about 30%. Oof, oof, oof. I, th- I mean, we, yeah. we wrote about ARC at the time as this was happening. Like, this is going to end badly. We've seen this before. Star money managers, money piles in. I think this may end up being the biggest retail incinerator in terms of dollars ever. Ben, this is exactly the point that I was making, that – you were writing about this. You weren't rooting for it, but you saw this as an inevitability. Not to this extent, but you see what I'm getting at? Yeah, that's, that's fair. Um, so this is, the, this is just adding to the confusion of making this whole period so difficult in terms of like the market getting killed, but consumer still is okay. Retail sales are still good. Earnings are still good. And yet the market is getting killed. Uh, but you could say like, well, the S&P is only down 27% it's going to get a lot worse. Which I hear that, but like look at things like this. So all here's of those the here's companies, all of those companies that are down 80 plus percent. Like maybe we're maybe you're looking at the S&P not being down enough and that's the wrong thing. The Nasdaq's down 35%. But this is the other thing with yeah, that that fun I mean, I thought it was going to end badly for it. I did not think it was going to end that badly that fast. The, no, the I don't speed think I, of it neither did I. So but Eric Belchunas tweeted this out. He says, I got a request for the latest ARC flows. Brace yourself. 100 million came in over the last month, 870 million over the past six months, 1.2 billion year to date, top 3% Whoa. among all ETFs. Wow. Money conti- continues to pile into this fund. They continue to believe in Kathy Wood. This, this is unlike anything we've ever seen in terms of usually you hit the peak, a bunch of money runs, rushes in because of f- funded well. It peaks, it falls, money rushes out. The only way that I can explain this is that people are using this responsibly. Not everyone, but this has to be a satellite position for most people. No, I mean, if this was if this was too big a position, you'd, you'd blow out of it. This can't be people that have 50% of their money in ARC doubling down. But top 3% among all ETFs in terms of flows, and this is not one of the biggest funds anymore, nor even, even close to it. Who's putting money so, into so, it? Is it advisors? Is it individuals? Who's, who's putting money in here? A billion dollars year to date, it doesn't sound like a ton of money. I mean, relative to its performance, it sounds astronomical. True. But um, anyway, uh, yeah, it's not great. Um, I, so I don't, I don't know because because I know that there's this trope that all mom and pop investors are idiots and they always sell at the bottom and buy at the top, which is it's just not true based on the data. But the thing is, is this good or bad? Because investors are who believe in this are showing discipline and they're they're doubling down and putting more money in when it's down. So would you rather have that or would you rather have people run for the exits? Ooh. Ooh. I, I don't have the answer, but that because that's the thing. The people who kind of want to thumb their noses at retail investors and say retail always does the wrong thing. This time they're 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 going in and they're doubling down on the losses. What's that the, is an interesting question. What's the dodgeball? That's a bold strategy, cotton. Uh, I don't know. I guess we'll see. 
Uh, yeah. All right. Be- stick with Belchunas. Uh, he said treasury ETFs have now taken in $111 billion year to date, which has doubled the old annual record. They now account for 26% of all ETF flows, despite making up 5% of the assets. Interesting, considering that treasury ETFs are getting smoked this year. This, to me, sounds like good investor behavior. Do you think some of this could be people finally have some losses in their bond mutual funds and they're 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 doing a swap from mutual funds to ETFs? Yes, because we've seen, haven't we seen a lot of outflows out of bond mutual funds? Like a lot? That's what I, that's what I thought, that there was a lot of, so this could be a tax thing where people are taking advantage. The, that's the only silver lining besides young people being able to buy stocks on sale is that this year, if you want to book some losses, you can, right? So if you ben, needed to offset yeah. some stuff, you could book some losses. To my point about a billion dollars in flows not being that much. Now, maybe this is apples and oranges. In fact, I'm sure it is. But uh, Jason Gempford, who is the man behind Sentiment Trader, tweeted, I don't think people really appreciate what's happening in the options market right now. Last week, retail traders bought $19.9 billion, with a B, worth of puts to open. Uh, they only bought $6.5 billion worth of calls. This is the first time in history that puts, that puts were three times calls. Now, this, again, gets to bearish extreme sentiment. And I will go back to uh, Jim Bianco did a tweet thread the other, the other week talking about how sentiment, like extreme bearish sentiment is fairly useless in a bear market. Um, and I think I- Like a sentiment's always bad in a bear market? You should expect it? Yeah. Like, I, I think I mostly agree with that. Um, this isn't a but. I'm just saying, man, it's, it's sentiment is pretty so here's, washed out. So here's my, here's my question as, as sort of a noob on this. I, I understand what the VIX is. So the VIX is at like 31 right now. As, as of this, t- you didn't do a timestamp yet. That's your new thing. So give us a timestamp. Oh, my bad. What time is it? It's Monday. It's October 17th. I'm uh, 24 hours from being uh, a man on the run. It's uh, 2 o'clock Eastern. All right. Uh, so the VIX is at 31, and I've heard a lot of people say, we can't have capitulation until the VIX shoots up to like 38 or 40. And I'm not a VIX structure guy. Like, I know what the VIX is. It's measuring like the next 30 months of vari- 30 days of variability in the stock market based on puts and calls, that sort of thing. I don't understand the structure enough to know. But if if this thing about buying puts is it's it's like so big, there was three times as many puts as calls. Why isn't the VIX higher? Shouldn't that know. make the VIX higher? What am I missing? I don't know. Okay. We were speaking but, about this with Nicholas. I really don't know what the answer is. Oh, and Katie Stockton, I'm I'm perplexed. I really don't have an answer for you because here's the other uh, thing. So this is yeah. if you look at the history of the VIX, it was higher than it is today in 2011. 2011, the stock market only went down like 19 percent in change. In that, you know, that's when people thought we we're gonna have a double dip, and the Europe stuff was going on in Greece. The VIX hit 40 back then. I think this I is the highest. Because I I don't know I don't know I don't even want to speak out of turn and say the VIX measures like surprises because I, I know it like it, it they I'm told it measures implied volatility over the next 30 days uh, and maybe there's been no like big shocks right now in 2011 there was a lot of headlines a lot of headline risk coming out of Europe right and, and, and I guess, stuff and I, I mean so outside like, of CPI outside of CPI there's been no there's been no surprises it's just been a slow bleed and maybe that's the thing like maybe it never gets to that capitulation point because it's there's been a 10 month bear market it's just been going on and it's it's kind of been the same thing. There besides, hasn't been a, you're right. that's besides a good, maybe the that's war. Good theory. It's been inflation this whole time. So maybe the ability for inflation to surprise on the upside to cause a VIX spike, maybe we don't see it. Maybe it has to be something else. That's a, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay, someone put this out. Uh, ten, this is from Deutsche Bank. 10-year UK gilt yields have returned to their average levels after being the most expensive ever two years ago. So they take this back to 1,700, and they show the average is 4.5%. But look at how quickly it went from zero to Same. four. Insane. It's, and you wonder why stuff is potentially breaking over there because it that the line that you that on that chart that looks like one of those you used to do those fake S and P five hundred charts where like <laughs> if it goes to zero tomorrow or something this looks like a fake chart to me this doesn't look real oh yeah yeah that's a hundred, that's such a good point it looks like you like entered a number by accident and like you factored yes. in a number yeah yeah you go to the analyst who created this chart and you go this can't be right you're it should have been forty five basis points not four point five percent. Uh, if you want to learn more about like what's going on in, in the UK, we had Mark Rubenstein, Josh and I did, um, on the YouTube channel. And Mark explains it really well because uh, that's obviously a little bit out of our depth over there. Is, is that uh, what we have to hang our hat in right now, though, in the United States is at least we're not Great Britain? No, no offense to anyone over there. They, they seem 10 times more screwed up than we are, which sounds 
hard at the moment, but it, it doesn't it seem, I feel like they have a new prime minister every like three months. Uh, I, I don't know what happened with Brexit, but it, I think it went through. Uh, I don't know. So Bespoke One did this thing where they showed, uh, they tweeted predictions are hard even for the Fed. And they showed uh, what the Fed funds rate was, what CPI was, and, and some comments by Powell. And man, these have not aged well. Uh, and I think it just goes to show that even the group that is responsible for a lot of the direction of what's going on like has no idea what they're going to be doing, what the economy is going to be doing in the future. This is one of the reasons that I, I'm not going to like try to make my investment strategy based on what the Fed does. But a lot of people are saying, listen, the Fed is not going to pivot because th- you have to trust them now. It's like, look at their history of what they say. It seems like for the last three years, everything they've said has been about what's going to happen next has been wrong. And, and I, 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 <laughs> I honestly don't blame them because it's been a very tough environment. But I, I think if they're trying to say, like, we're not going to change our minds, it's like, yeah, you are. You're going to change your mind if the economy does something and forces your hand, which is kind of what's been happening. They say, this is what we're going to do. Then the economy does something else. And they say, okay, never mind. We're going to do this now. It's really hard. This is really hard because it does sound like they mean it. And I understand that they've said things in the past that they went back on and and were wrong on. And and maybe they do. I mean, tough. Uh, I honestly think that what they should do for a while is just shut up and stop talking. Like every time they talk, some, like just like if nothing is going to change, then don't say anything. I feel like they're getting way too much joy out of like controlling the markets. And I think it's a little too much ego driven at this point. I think joy is a bit strong. I don't think they're getting much joy out of this. Neil Kashkari said he was happy when stocks fell after that one. Remember that? He said he was happy to see stocks fall 3% that one day. Is he on TikTok? I don't know. He, he's finding he's joy He's become in something of an influencer. Uh, yes. The 10-year yields have risen for 11 consecutive weeks. Longest streak since 1978. Unreal. And what is it at? 4% now? Yeah. Oh, credit to you. Ben, last week, were you saying how like the bond market might predict a Fed pivot? Were you saying something like that? Yes. I said the bond market is going to predict a Fed pivot. The bonds will fall before the Fed starts lowering rates. That's okay. my call. So, so, so I think Morgan Stanley, uh, maybe they're listening. Who knows? They said if rates fall ahead of a decline in inflation, which we expect, it will give legs to the rally that began last Tuesday. Um, so again, if rates fall ahead of a decline in inflation. Oh, that's not what you were saying, is it? Yeah, pretty much. No. If Like the bond market is going to sniff it out. So if the Fed keeps raising 75 basis points, and then 50 basis points, they get to like four and a half or five percent. It wouldn't surprise me if if the 10 years down to three and a half or three in the bond market says, we don't believe you. We're going lower because you already beat inflation and it's it's peaked. That's that's my thought process. OK, I could totally see that happening where the Fed continues to raise too long and overstay their welcome, even though the bond market has already moved past it and sniffs out inflation is peaked and coming down and the market has moved down while the Fed is still stuck in higher rate territory. Then they're going to have to reverse course again. Hey, apropos of nothing, how do you feel about uh, Liam Neeson and a Naked Gun reboot? Because I have strong feelings. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty anti-remaking classic movies. That's, yeah, my, so- that's usually my stance. There's one Lieutenant Frank Drebin. It's one of the greatest comedies of all time. I don't know if this is the – actually, this is not the first time I belly laughed. The first time I belly laughed was during uh, – uh, was Caddyshack. Um, uh, it was a Rodney Dangerfield. I remember being like five years old and crying, laughing at like one of his fart jokes. But when when uh, Leslie Nielsen goes to the bathroom with his mic still on. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> which is which one is that? I mean there's so many of them. They all, they all kind of run together for me. I don't know if that's the original, but come on. Who asked for this? Yeah. Whatever happened to just ripping off a movie? Like you can rip off and do a comedy that's kind of in the Naked Gun tone, but don't make it be Naked Gun. Right? Yeah, I'm anti. All right, so inflation. We got the numbers last Thursday, and the core is accelerating. Uh, What the hell is going on? I got nothing, man. I, I mean, a lot of... If you read the people who go and break down each component of inflation, the thing everyone is talking about now continues to be the rent piece and the housing Shelter, piece. Yeah, yeah. And that that's that's going to continue to stay high for a while. 
I mean, am I dumb here? The Fed should know all this stuff, right? Like everyone else. Well, I mean, the, the opposite side of that is is if that shelter cost is being overstated now, it was being understated last year, and then inflation was probably higher than we think last year. So maybe inflation really was 12% or something instead of 9 at the worst of it. But obviously the Fed knows this, but I guess I, people are so anchored to the numbers now, it doesn't matter what the component pieces are. They need but to I see the number come down lower. The rental piece is on a lag because it incorporates it's, – it's using existing rent. So as new rentals come into the data set, it's right. going to remain elevated. It's a third – I don't know how big rent is, but shelter is a third of CPI. So how does it get down to 2%? Was it going to take three years? It could take a little while. Uh, Bill McBride tweeted, the National Average Wage Index increased sixty increased to 60575 uh, in 2021, up 9%. Uh, this is the largest percentage increase in wages since the early 80s. So uh, as we keep saying, it's all about wages. Is it though? Yes. It's it, it's not though. Because there's no way that – why is it all about wages? Explain this to me. Hang on a sec. Did I misquote that? The national average – okay. Uh, why is it all about wages? Because A, those don't those don't come down. It's the stickiest part of inflation. And B, consumer spending is the entire economy. And the more money people make, the more money they demand. And then things go up in price and they demand more wages. Like this is the whole game. It's a whole enchilada. Okay, but knowing the economy is where it is right now, how many people have the ability to go in and negotiate higher wages from here? They've already negotiated higher wages because of everything that's happened. But how, how easy is it going to be to negotiate higher wages from here? We don't know. If prices keep going up, they're going to keep demanding wages, uh, wage increases. Okay. So I talked about this last week, and I, I made the point that I think that it's it's the lower class of income people have now had a very good few years here. And a few people pushed back. And you said, don't read the comments on this one, Ben. Actually, a lot of people agreed with me. Only a few people called me a communist, which which was I would have taken the, the over on whatever that number was. So look at this. So to people who think that this is this is the worst on lower class income people, so the Federal Reserve has this the ability to look at household wealth. And they look at this on a quarterly basis. So this is through Q2. So it's obviously gotten worse since then probably. But look at this chart of wealth by the bottom 50%. This is net worth. They have this much data going back to 1989. From 1989 to the pre-GFC 2007 peak, the net worth of the bottom 50% went from like 770 billion to 1.4 trillion. So that was in almost two decades. And it crashed 190 billion by 2011, which is, it you know kind of tracked the housing market there. People got just, their net worth of the bottom 50% just got wrecked. It, it almost went to zero from the great financial crisis. By the end of 2019, it slowly worked its way back up to $2 trillion. And from pre-pandemic, that's the end of 2019 to now, it went up to $4.4 trillion. So in the last three years, the bottom 50% has gained $2.4 trillion. That was more than the entire wealth they had by the end of 2019. And so I know that inflation is not great for people on the lower end of the income scale because it hurts their budget. But you, we've just seen the greatest relative increase in wealth for the bottom 50% that we've ever seen. So I don't know. And why? Because they made more money. Housing prices helped, obviously. The government gave them money, that sort of thing. I just think it's, it's – I think we're, we're – I think we're rushing it a little bit to say that this isn't hasn't been a good thing in some ways for some people. Uh, can I make a confession that has absolutely nothing to do with what you just said? Stage zero. Yeah. Um, now listen, I hear you on all of that stuff. Um, And yes, in a vacuum, this is a good thing. It is a good thing. Not even in a vacuum, it is a good thing. Uh, Their net worth has but, exploded higher in the last three years. I'm so just saying. Prices. Okay, but but the net worth is up over 100 percent for the bottom 50 percent. It took over 20 years to get that high before, to increase by that much. I'm just saying that the increase in net worth has far outstripped any 
inflation. And I know that this is not evenly that net worth is not evenly distributed, but this is the bottom. This is not the top one percent we're talking about here. This yeah. is the bottom fifty percent. I'm just saying, like maybe this experiment that we tried worked out better than we anticipated. And I know that that's caused a lot of the inflation, and people seriously don't like that. But I'm saying, still, like maybe maybe some of this experiment wasn't all bad. That's we're still in the ex- we're still in the experimental phase. We don't know. Oh, to that point. Uh, somebody asked us, how come you guys don't talk about uh, – everyone talks about the Fed without talking about the fiscal stimulus. Uh, why don't you guys mention that enough? And I think that's a fair point. Um, well, send, we talked about that for months and months and months, I guess, okay. when it happened. Yeah. But yeah, it's true. The, the Fed kept rates at 0% from 2009 to 2015, and we got no inflation. And so that's – it is true that you can't Matter blame fact, this all on the Fed. A take that definitely has aged horribly, and we've got a lot of them is prior to the inflation rearing its ugly head, we were saying, like, why wouldn't Congress just do this every time? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and now it's, now it's probably never going to happen again or not for a while. I, I think that will be interesting, though. If, if we do get a recession and people are start feeling it and people start losing jobs and they kind of say, where's my $1,200 check this time? You did it last time. Mm. I think that, like, inflation versus that mentality is going to be interesting to see how the politicians react. Ben, there, there are going to be a lot of people who want their checks the next time because they got them last time. Ben, open up a, open up a stock chart if you would. Okay. Now, when I, when I say those words, where do you even go? I'm curious. I'm on Y charts. Okay. Okay. Uh, you got to look at, you got to look at candlesticks to tell this, this sad story. I bought an individual stock uh, a few weeks ago for the first time. I don't know if it's the first time this year. Um, I can't remember, but I feel like it's been a while since I tried to, since I tried to buy one of these stocks. So I bought Netflix. It was, it had, it was showing relative outperformance. It was the best performing of the fan mag. Now, listen, it, it has its own stories. It got killed, but I do believe in the turn of the round. I do believe that they're going to figure out ways to monetize the ad supported. Wait, did but, you get, did you get stopped out of the stock? Let me finish my story. Uh, that being said. That being said, this was not an investment. This was this was a trade, um, and as such, I had my stop in. Right, I'm not good about to let a trade turn into a bad investment, so I was willing to risk. I think around ten percent. I thought it, I thought it could get up into the gap, and I got stopped out on Tuesday uh, at the close, which was I don't know around two fifteen. Uh, the stock is now at two forty eight. Uh, and it's going into earnings tonight. So do I hope it goes down 15% after earnings? No, I'm not that much of a of a monster. But I hope it doesn't go up 15%. You well, you see what, what I mean? it's up today? It's up 8% today. Oh, yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking right now. <laughs> <laughs> what do you so what do you think about their their they said they're gonna do six ninety nine a month, I think, for ad. I think it'd be really hard to go from no ads to ads where so I know a lot of people are worried about people trading down to the ad version. I think that'd be very hard to do. If if I've been watching Netflix with people aren't going to trade down because we've we've gotten used to no ads and going back to ads stinks. What's going but to I, happen? I, I they're suspect gonna get a, they could get a bunch of new people signing up though, don't you think? That's that's where I'm going with this. The people that have that are getting kicked out because they're limiting sharing, those people who are on their parents' plan might sign up for the six ninety nine version. And I think that is going to be very successful. I think, I think it actually I think it actually might work. I think they're gonna so, get some new subscribers from this. I am I am bullish on the fundamentals, but this was a this was a you know a trade on. I've got to use my discipline. Um, <laughs> anyway. Gotta take your losses, back. right? Got yeah, take your losses. See, I don't know how to do that. All right. Let's talk about housing. Um, all right, we got an email. In October of last year, I had a committed offer from Open Door for my house at 830K. I eventually canceled due to my daughter moving in with me. They now send me offers from time to time and they've been dropping like a rock. Last week, I received a preliminary offer of 590K. This is real world stuff. <laughs> now- Are you laughing? No, I'm, I, that was like the, ooh. Do oh, you I can't, think- I can't, I can't see you, so. Oh, do, you, do you think that is, I mean, obviously that's to do with the housing market, but is that also to do with Open Door being kind of screwed and lowballing people? Um. That's a good question. I, I would assume it's more of the housing market than open door changing their strategy, but you could, maybe, uh, maybe. I want to spend a second here. 
um, Colin Roche tweeted, here's my basic reasoning on why the Fed should slow or pause here. We have no idea what 7% mortgage rates will do to housing, and it's going to take a year for that to fully filter through. The Fed could be creating a legitimate housing crisis here, and we won't know it for years. I said that the labor market is everything. I'm going to say that also. Like, you got to throw in housing there. Well, we, we talked about this a couple months ago. I think it's estimated if you include everything, construction and the loan side of things and realtors and all this stuff that that is part of the housing complex, it's close to 20% of GDP. And wow. I don't think people realize how many jobs are going to be lost in the housing industry in the coming months. I talked to someone this weekend who was part of a loan department, and it was one of these uh, soccer deals where we had a soccer get-up app get together after my daughter's game. And someone said, I worked in a loan department, and I'm just thinking to myself, like, half of that department's probably going to be gone. Like, because there's no, they've been living off of refinancings for the last two or three years, five years maybe, uh, or new households being formed. That stuff is going to slow so much that people are going to be losing jobs like crazy in those sectors. So I think Colin's right. Uh, this sort of stuff happens on a lag. And they've been raising interest rates for how many months now? And how high have, have they got, you know, up? That, that's been my biggest problem. I don't fault the Fed for raising rates. They obviously needed to. But the, it's the speed at which they're raising them and how fast they've let things like mortgage rates go from three to seven that is going to eventually probably break stuff. It's, Are we surprised we, that, that it's taking this long? In other words, the damage that we've seen is in financial conditions, really stocks, right? For the most part, why is it taking longer to impact the economy? And I think you made a, you made a good point. And I think Nick Cole has talked about this, about warehousing talent. Like people are, hes companies are hesitant. Yeah, they're going to slow hiring, but companies are hesitant to lay off people, even if they're fearful of a recession, because it's been hard. It's hard to replace people. It's hard to bring it's them also, back. It's also, if you look at the data besides the stock market so far and the housing market rolling over a little bit, things for most businesses continue to go well because people had all this excess savings because for two years they didn't spend a lot of money. So I think you're still seeing people spend down that excess savings. And I think that's kind of propped stuff up and probably made inflation worse than it would have been otherwise. I think we yeah. have to, it's it's the the rabbit going through this, working its way through the snake. I think it's going to be well. We're starting to see, so I saw this in my local Wood TV. This is the local West Michigan news the other day. And it says, plans scrapped for a 24-story tower containing apartments, office space, and parking in downtown Grand Rapids. And they said they were going to do this. They had all the plans. He said, it's not possible in this current economic market for, to move forward with this project at this scale. He said the decision was based on higher construction costs, huge interest rate hikes, and supply chain unpredictability causing, would pushing the project out further than you'd think. That If you add all those things up, that, that makes sense for places pulling back on investment right now. So maybe the stuff that's already been going on is fine, but future investment seem, is the thing that would make the most sense to stall out, right? Places are just going to cut back because that hurdle rate is so much higher now. Mm -hmm. All right, we got a, we also got a follow-up from someone who is a Toronto real estate broker. Last week we asked, like, what's going on in Toronto and Vancouver? Toronto broker here. I think this is a YouTube comment. Entire market is down 25% regardless of what figures they put out. Nothing is moving anymore. Most sellers just do some price changes, then come off the market. Literally everyone refinanced under 3% for a five-year fix in 2020 to 2021. So unless rates come down dramatically by 2025, there will be an apocalypse over here. Average mortgage is over $600,000. I can't believe more people aren't talking about this. So five-year fixed rates that they do in Canada for most of these loans. I can't imagine staring down the barrel of that gun, just knowing that it's the, coming. The, the, yeah, the math doesn't work on this, right? How are people no, I mean, supposed to go from, from I mean, uh, you know, $1,000 a month to $3,100? I mean, we talk, we talk about this for... It really stinks for people who are buying their first home and coming into this because affordability is so bad. This is people who've already bought a house. So you could have bought a house in a hot, hot real estate market like Toronto and paid an ungodly sum of money for a really tiny place. And now your rate's going to go higher and your payment's going to go up. I don't know what they do, right? Can you imagine that that like wall of in 2025, 2026, 2027 of people seeing their rates go to 6 or 7%? No. No. Uh, ben, let's talk about um, private markets. CB Insights did their state of venture. Um, I want to run through some charts here. 
that funding reaches 300, this is global, $330 billion, $329 billion in 2022 so far, projected to go to 440 or so down from, what is that? Uh, 630 in 2021. Oh, wait. Oh, 630. I'm sorry. I couldn't read that. 630. Okay. So I was like, huh. That's you, actually- you mentioned that your eyes are going bad. That's a very small number. Uh, you notice I didn't even have to squint and look close like you. That's because I still have my vision. It's still there. It is a very small number though. And, and what can I say? You could see that. That is very impressive. Um, so one of the reasons why is year over year for Q3, it looks like the numbers are down fairly significantly, but Q1 and Q2 were still pretty elevated. And a lot of this is still coming from the US. Uh, I have to say this, these numbers, I would have projected a way bigger fall off in deals than, than what it's showing here. So we're going to get to the meat, like the, the why. So okay. U.S. is responsible for 49% of global Q3 funding. The average global deal size dropped to 18 million down from Ben. What is that number? Is that 25? 25. So that makes sense. So it's less money because the rounds are down this year. So here, so here's here's the meat. Uh, funding from 100 million dollar plus what they call mega rounds plummets to 29.6 billion dollars down from a peak of what? I can't see that number. Oh. Wait, number of deals, is that one you're looking for right here? Yeah. It was like 420 at the high. Okay. To so the bi- so so there it is. So the smaller round sizes, like the early stage stuff is not slowing down. The numbers really aren't coming down that much. But the mega rounds are drying up. So you, you said you said here's the meat on this one. For the last five days, uh, my daughter, my oldest daughter and my son have been walking around the house because they heard one Arby's commercial saying, Arby's, we have, you know, it's Vin, isn't it Ving Rhames who does it? I don't Arby's, know. Arby's, we have the meats. And not a roast my, beef guy. Yeah, it's not bad. Beef and cheddar is pretty good. But my, my son and daughter keep walking, running our house going, Arby's, we have the meats. Just all day. <laughs> they think it's the funniest thing ever. I don't know why. Because they don't see a lot of commercials, maybe. Oh, so so we had, uh, speaking of children, we had a rough week. As listeners know, Kobe broke his tibia last week. Um, so a few rough nights, but he's, he's on the mend. But what's really... I don't know if cute is the right word, uh, but he's he's learned how to how to uh, use the wheelchair like very well. He's like turning one wheel forward, one wheel backwards. <laughs> so he's getting around the house in his wheelchair. Okay, that's pretty good. Did you have to put some ramps in anywhere? No ramps. Uh, okay, I guess he's, he's, he's small enough that you can just kind of pick him up and move him down the stairs. He's doing it. All right, so let's get to great quarter, guys. I'm very happy to see that quarter is starting to tweet some of the best snippets. Uh, so last week, slash they also, week, if, if you sign up too, they have a newsletter now that sends some highlights of the best earning reports as well, which is, which is great. All right. So last week we heard from JP Morgan, oh no, BlackRock, I think JP Morgan, or was that this morning? I can't remember, but let's just read some, some quotes. Uh, this is from the CFO of JP Morgan. He said, cash buffers remain elevated across all income segments. However, with spending growing faster than income, we are seeing a continued decrease in median deposits year on year, particularly in the lower income segments. You want to know why? Because they're not paying anything in their deposits. They're making way- I'm going to get to this. No, so let's go- no, 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 no. No, people. Oh, don't you're saying because people are spending down stuff? Yeah, 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 yeah. This is not like an investment thing. Right. Um, Jamie Dimon said, "I think, I think we're in an environment where it's kind of odd, which is very strong consumer spend. You see it in our numbers. You see it in other people's numbers. Up ten percent prior to last year. Up thirty five percent pre COVID. Balance sheets are very good for consumers. Credit card borrowing is normalizing, and not getting worse, um, and that's really good. So you go into a recession." You've got a very strong consumer. See, this is what you've you're asking. Why aren't things getting worse? We talk. We've talked about this for months too. People spent the la- the ten years following the Great Financial Crisis, preparing their bat- balance sheets, and then two more years they got way better. This mm-hmm. is why inflation is remaining so high because people had they the consumer has never been more ready for this kind of environment. I feel like we we said that a long time ago. Um, and I was sort of like hesitant to say it out loud, but that the consumer has never been in better, has never been better prepared to go into a recession. I said a blog post with that exact title. Okay. When was that? Mm. Well, you find you keep, it. Let me, let me just sit, you keep say, talking. Quote, and I'll do some, I'll right. do some uh, re- research here. All right. Here's bank of America. 
Our U.S. consumer clients remained resilient with strong, although slower growing spending levels and still maintained elevated deposit amounts. That's that's Brian Moynihan. All Across right, the June, bank, June 28th, has the consumer ever been more prepared for a recession? June what, of this year? Yeah. Oh, that, that's, that's late. I feel like we were talking about it earlier. But anyway. Yeah, we were. Across the bank, we grew loans by 12% over the last year. Um, Alex Morris, who has a, that great substack, The Science of Hitting, showed Bank of America's net interest income, which is, I don't know if that's the biggest driver of how they make money. I really don't know. But it's a huge portion of it. It's basically the spread. Uh, it was $13.8 billion, up 24% year over year, and absolutely looking like a record. Okay, this gets into my thing about corporations deserving more blame. So they had a story about this in the FT saying that the largest banks are benefiting from the Fed's campaign to raise interest rates. Of course. And they say, uh, when all is said and done, we this is from a Barclays banking analyst. When all is said and done, we think for our composite, this will be a record quarter for net interest income for banks. And they showed JP Morgan, City Wells, their net interest income is going up. And what that means is the amount they're earning from loans versus the amount they're paying out. And so this article was saying they're earning way more money from loans, but they're not paying anything more out more on their savings and CDs and stuff. So they're just making a bigger spread. This is this is my thing about corporations making inflation worse or taking advantage of inflation. The big corporations here, again, they didn't cause this, but they're taking advantage of it, certainly. And banks are like the the this for how slow they're moving up their interest expenses. I think it's ridiculous for what they charge for credit cards and mortgages and they're paying out five, 10 basis points still on savings accounts with 7% mortgages. It's ridiculous. Yeah. That here, here to that for sure. All right. So we're going to hear from, uh, we're going to hear from Netflix tomorrow. Who else we have coming up this week? Uh, so, okay. So you're back in your trading days. You got like 10 screens in front of you. You're a trader again. Are you buying puts or calls into Netflix's earnings? Stock looks good. So, I mean, uh, I would be a buyer of weekly calls. Uh, I'm not, but, you know, you asked me what I would be doing if I was still trading. Uh, who, 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 do we, who else do we have this week? Why can't I find this? Oh, here we go. Sorry. Um, all right. So tomorrow we've got- You squinting into the camera is like me having a FaceTime with my mother. <laughs> she gets her face as close to the uh... camera spot. That's what you look like. All right, so by the time this comes out, we will have heard from Netflix and Goldman and Intuitive Surgical and Johnson & Johnson. Once we've got Tesla, uh, we've got Snap on Thursday, which you know I love Snap earnings even though so, it means so, nothing. So if Netflix tanks, we should probably cut that part out. Which part? No. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, on Friday, we've got Verizon. That'll, that'll be interesting because Verizon is obviously super, super exposed to the consumer, and we've got American Express. So, Ben, are you ready for earnings season? It's the biggest earnings season since last earnings season. I know that you know, for sure. I, I resent that. Actually, speaking of uh, it's earnings season, I, I watched uh, that reminded so, me of this, wedding season. He, wait, I was, this, what? Is, this is the thing that has been going on, though, for the past year. We get bad inflation number, the stock market crashes, then earnings come out, and the stock market does better because companies are still doing fine. Then we get bad inflation again, stock market crashes, then earnings come out again, and it's better than expected. Don't you think that, like, this is why we have all these bear market rallies, because earnings have still been fine. It's inflation that's been bad. Mm. Um, I was watching a uh, wedding crash. It's on Netflix. It on HBO? Netflix. Okay. People, uh, people complain Netflix is bad. If you pull up the main thing the other day, I saw like great stuff. this is forty wedding crash. I saw like six yeah. good movies, and yeah. I'm like, yeah, it's still maybe, got great movies on there. Maybe it's it's light on original content right now. Yes. Um, but wedding the first like hour of wedding singers or, or wedding singers of wedding crashes is so good before it starts to like get like the sad music and it starts to get serious-ish? Yes. It's good until uh, they, they walk away from the house. Exactly. Where, where Vince, Vince Vaughn says, the painting was a gift, Todd. <laughs> gets, gets me every time. <laughs> All right. Did you read this story about the Bird Scooter founder? I did I not. Think, I think the first time we ever heard of Bird Scooters was- In some, Texas? A bunch of people sent us, yeah, we were in Texas riding them around Austin. So- Bird Scooter, I think it was a SPAC that went public and it was like, I got the chart in here. When it went public, it got to a high of $2.5 billion market cap. This is in late 2021. It's now at a market cap of $100 million. And the Bird Scooter founder, this guy, he bought a, a mansion in Miami for $22 million. And 
his stake in Bird is now worth less than he paid for that mansion. So he's selling the mansion. So he had a 13% Oof. stake in the company. It's his stake is now worth 12 million. It was it, Oof. Yeah. So Oof. You know, there's the old saying that's like it's better to have loved and lost than never loved at all. I think when it comes to making money, so Bird's down 96%. Yeah. And I think this guy probably, I think he sold another company before, so he probably got money, but he's selling this mansion now and people are speculating he's selling it because his, his, he, he probably thought he was going to be worth whatever, $100 million, $200 million. I, I mean, listen, I know, you know, you don't cry for like people that lost billions, you know, whatever. I'm sure this guy's fine, but this, the, I really feel for this person. You, you would have rather never made that money in the first place. Like if, if you're worth $10 million, but you were worth a hundred you feel way worse than the person who is worth seven now is worth 10, right? Totally. Because this you, has got be, to be devastating. Oh, man, it's, I can't even imagine. All right, uh, here's someone who never loses though. Boomers, this is from CNBC. Social security benefit beneficiaries can expect an 8.7% boost to benefits in 2023. Social security administration announced the increase tops the 5.9% cost of living adjustment for 2022, which was at the time the highest in four decades. So they got a 6% boost in Social Security last year. In 2023, they're going to get a 9% boost. Uh, average Social Security retiree benefit will increase 150 bucks a month to almost a little over $1,800 a month in 2023, up from 16 and change in 2022. Boomers win again, right? They're not going to leave anything for us. They've they're got an inflation-hedged annuity here. And I know people think that Social Security is like going to go out of business and not make any money and it's going to be gone. Uh, without Social Security, so many people would be screwed in this country when it comes to retirement. I think Social Security is one of the most like under, uh, just underrated programs we have in this country for keeping people afloat when they stop working. I'm not really into like generation shaming. It's just not my thing. I know. I can't, I can't help it sometimes though. Why? I don't know. I mean, I, I it's, it's a luck of the draw when you're born. Um, I, I do think the boomers deserve a little bit of derision for what they've, I, I feel like they're, they're kind of burning the bridge down behind them in some ways. It, it feels that way. I, I, I can see why people feel that way. Well, they'll be saying that about us someday. This is crazy. Probably. One of the, no, the, the funny thing is though, they could be saying in, in 20 or 30 years, can you believe the millennials who got to buy a house at those prices with 3% mortgages? People are going to be mad at the millennials who did that in 20 exactly. or 30 years. I, I, They're I coming do for us that. too. Don't throw Let's stones. Do uh, one of the craziest charts of the pandemic was ExxonMobil being smaller than Zoom market cap mm -hmm. wise for a second. I think at $150 billion, uh, Zoom was larger than Exxon. So that was in the that was at the end of 2020, right? The end of 2020. So it's two years later and Exxon is now almost 20 times larger than Zoom. Can you believe that? <laughs> that is pretty hard to believe. So Zoom at their peak was, hang on. 150, no? For market cap, is that what it was? 150 billion? Yeah. 160 yeah. billion. Yeah. It's 22 now. Honestly, 22 still feels high. Isn't it, isn't it funny how things work in bear markets? In bull markets, you think 160, that they could be a $300 <laughs> billion dollar company. Yeah, yeah. Then they get to 22 in a bear market and you go, yeah, this should be a $10 should be billion 10. Dollar company. Should be 10. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so right now, Ben and I are doing a podcast. I have my, we had to, we had to pull an audible. I've got my AirPods in. I'm talking to Ben on the phone and I can't see him. So if this podcast has sounded a little bit disjointed and not to mention like, I said before this, it was a little bit difficult seeing Ben and not having like two screens because I've got my Google Doc, I've got my Ben, I got to see Ben, I got to see Ben. Um, so I was going through uh, uh, Packy's Twitter feed the other day and he he tweeted two things that blew my face right off. One of them was uh, this guy, Marquez Brownlee, tweeted a video of this VR headset. Ben, did you watch this? No. Pause and watch this. Okay, I haven't really said much about the whole metaverse and the future of VR stuff, but this is just a single laptop and the new Quest Pro paired together and with this real-time Oh, okay. So you put the headset on and it makes it look like you have... So describe what you, were, describe what you were just looking at. He put a headset on and then he, it looks like he has four huge monitors now that he never had before. Oh, you're, not, you're not describing this properly. They're windows, from his, they're windows from his laptop that now are bigger through the VR headset. 
There's a he man looks- who, there's a person who is sitting down with a laptop computer in front of them, just a single laptop. Puts on the headset and vroom, he's got like three screens behind him. That's pretty cool. But I feel like if you don't have the four monitors, the Bloomberg monitors at your desk, it's not as much of a flex. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's it's all about the flex, but I get it. If, if you're traveling and had this, I said I mean, before, that's pretty sweet. It would be cool if you could just have a monitor waiting for you in a hotel room if you needed it, right? To plug into. Okay. Yes. That's pretty cool. I'm, I, I'm, I'm still, right. I'm, I'm very hesitant to think people are going to wear stuff on their head. I think it's going to have to be like a monocle or something. It's going to have to be small or people wearing anything ben, on their head. How, is, how dumb did AirPods look at first? I never thought AirPods looked that dumb. You think so? I did. I did. Okay. Uh, pa- Packy also tweeted this thing called podcast.ai. Did you listen to this? All right, I didn't listen. I, I got I to gotta be honest here. This one didn't really blow my mind, and it doesn't impress me that much. Is that, is that wrong of me? You said you didn't listen, but you're coming to, you're, you're, you have an opinion without listening. I'm not going to listen because it's fake. Why would I listen? It's, a, it's Joe Rogan interviewing Steve Jobs, but it's from that's, an AI. That's a, that's a terrible take. I don't like that attitude. I got to be honest. I, I, all right. So here's the thing. I, Why would I you think, listen? Cause it's fake. All right. So ben, they, you don't get, they, to, you don't get listen, to talk. You don't get to talk. The, the AI generated art stuff is I think awesome. Like if you said, make me a picture of this or make me a song of this or make me a video of this, that a, I think that is really cool. Listening to Joe Rogan interview, fake Joe Rogan interview, fake Steve jobs. I don't know. It just doesn't do it for me. Call all right, me listen, I'm, I'm not saying that I want to listen to fake podcasts. My point is, if you listen to this for two minutes, it's scary. This is Joe Rogan, but not actually Joe Rogan. It's a computer. And it's it's the computer is, is playing Joe Rogan. I don't even know what you call it. Interviewing Steve Jobs. And it is really uh, incredible that this technology exists. And it seems inevitable with all of the money pouring into this. I know people, you know, money's been pouring into AI for a long, long time. Um, but something's going to come out of this. Yeah, you can already listen to a fake podcast with Joe Rogan and Steve Jobs. Um, all right. Don't like I, your I do, attitude. I, do think the, the art, I think the art stuff is, is, is even cooler, though. Listen, again, it's not about the podcast. It's about the technology. All right. Somebody, uh, a listener, uh, emailed us because I was talking about Burger King last week. When you go to Burger King... Always order your burger, quote, off the grill. They will grill fresh your patty for you upon order. You won't get one that has been sitting in one of those trays. Really elevates the experience. So that's a pro tip right there. So that's why the, the drive throughs take so long, because everyone's ordering them off the grill. Is that the problem? All right, we got a bunch of feedback on the <laughs> Long John versus Eclair. It's uh, Eclair. What's the feedback? No one calls it Eclair. I I've never heard that before. Eclair. Okay, here's the thing. The C, it's like a G. It's called an Eclair. No, that's not that's not how I was saying. It's Eclair. It's an okay. Eclair. Here's, here's the All problem. Right, this on. is this is another instance of you being a coastal elitist. An Eclair is a pastry. It's not a donut. That I they look like a long john, but it's not a long john. That's true. An Eclair john, is a pastry. That's right. Yeah, it's a pastry, not a donut. So this was just another instance of you being a I'm a flyover guy here. You're an, a coastal elitist. Okay, whatever. Um, Ben, <laughs> I can't believe I'm about to give you some more credit after you spoke to me that way. <laughs> I keep seeing, I keep seeing these, this, this tweet, this promoted tweet from Amazon. Prime early access sale is here. Uh, you've been bullish on Black Friday on just waiting for the deals. I so keep I seeing think, this tweet over and over and over and over. So they're just gonna have Black Friday deals from now until Christmas, probably, and then after Christmas sales. Yeah, there's gonna be a lot of inventory available. So you I saw this. You buy f- your presents early this year. I saw this on the flight over here. The LA Clippers are launching a streaming service. This is from uh, Fund Office Sports tweeted this. A first for the NBA. It's called Clipper Vision. We'll okay, feature Steve, s- Steve Ballmer was on CNBC today talking about this, actually. I saw that. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. It's called Clipper Vision. It will feature six live viewing options and cost 200 bucks for 74 games this season. Why only 74? Wait. Probably the home. home d- do they home. cut the schedule to 74 games? Uh, Be that no. as it may. Right? It's 82 games. I don't think they so they, anyway. they, sh- they they showed what it's going to be. It could be like old Clippers players watching the games or old coaches talking about the games as they're going on. That's what it's going to be like. What about like different different uh, what about like different ver- uh, different uh, angles? 
I didn't watch. I didn't get the whole thing, but that that's what I. That's the part of it that I saw. So it could be like this is an Davis AR, an AR, a- an AR court vision stream. So I, I guess that makes sense that as streaming evolves, a lot of more of it is going to be personalized to you, the fan. I would pay for something like this sense. potentially for the Knicks. Okay, I definitely wouldn't pay for it for the Lions, but it's kind of a cool idea. All right, recommendations, Ben. What do you got? All right, finished Bad Sisters on Apple. It Never was. Heard of it. Okay. Oh, okay. I, I, I told you about it here. He just it's uh Sharon from uh Catastrophe. Oh, she she's wrote, great. directed it. It's it's kind of like White Lotus in that it's a dark comedy. In the very first episode, someone dies and they spend the rest of the season getting to the point where how this person died. I'm I, I think I'm coming to the point that most streaming shows should be eight episodes instead of ten. So it's probably oh, too yeah. long, but I it was a really well done show. It had some dark humor. It, and the the bad guy in the show is like one of the most hated characters that I've ever hated in my life. How it's, about this, Ben? Most eps, most seasons should be six episodes. Remember, I think they should uh, do, but yeah. Uh, I don't know if Mayor of Easttown was six episodes, but the one with Hugh Grant and Nicole Kidman. I can't remember the name of it. Yeah, it's like a so miniseries. I, 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 want, I want six episodes. Yeah, and this one was a miniseries too. It's just one season. It's I, I really liked it. It was too long. The same thing with the offer. I finally finished the offer on Paramount Plus. It was ten episodes. It should have been five, maybe. Probably could have been a movie. I also rewatched this weekend. I caught on HBO Max The Firm. I haven't Tom watched Cruise? it in forever. Yes, the it it, it tells it pretty it? well. Uh, it Danny Gene, Hack, Gene Hackman, a ton of that guys. Uh, Nick Nolte, Holly Hunter. Really good movie. It's good. It's good. It is kind of funny. I, I guess it's just because of John Grisham, but I feel like they don't make lawyer thrillers anymore. Is that just because John Grisham wrote them all in the nineties? Oh, it's yeah, yeah. The Firm was a good one. But here's the thing. So they, at the beginning of the movie, Tom Cruise is like top five in his class at Harvard for, for law school. So he's being courted by all these huge law firms. And the law firm that gets him from Memphis is they offer to give him a low interest mortgage rate and pay off his student loans. I feel like if you offer that to a Gen Z or millennial person today and the, the catch is they kill people there and they work for the mob, you'd probably take that job, <laughs> right? If they're going to offer you a low interest rate mortgage and pay off your student loans, Seems like it's worth the risk to work for the, the mob. Early, the, early, the early 90s Grisham movies. There was The Rainmaker with Matt Damon. What was the one with Chris uh, with Chris O'Donnell? <sighs> yeah, I know what you're talking about. Then the Matthew McConaughey one. Uh, McC- Samuel McConaughey Jackson. was in one? Yeah, what was that? Oh, Sandra A Time, to kill. Had, a time, time to, to kill. A Time to Kill. Yeah. Um, that was great. Chris O'Donnell, John Grisham. What was this called? The but he Chamber? Created, he, yeah, yeah, that was Is okay. That it? He created a genre of movies... All by himself. John Grisham. Yeah. The other thing is, I kind of forgot how good Gene Hackman is. That guy was a one of one. There's there's no one like that anymore. No, no, no. Uh, That's all I got. Hang on. Which one am I looking for? Not the chamber. Was it the chamber? Maybe it was. I think it is. Hang on a a sec. I don't think it is. But maybe I'm wrong. Um, Oh, the Pelican Brief. That was a good book. Uh, all right, Ben. So my kids are obsessed with, uh, with Halloween. And, uh, I mean, all kids are, I'm sorry. I meant the nightmare before Christmas. They love that movie. Is it on Disney? I don't think my kids ever watched that one. They love that movie. That movie scared the bejesus out of me when I saw it. Or even, it was, it's, it's unsettling. So there's a song in there that they love and they love to sing. It's called, uh, this is Halloween. So this is, these are the lyrics. Now, again, Logan's three and he's singing the song. Kobe's five. Okay. This is Halloween, this is Halloween, pumpkin scream in the dead of night. This is Halloween, everybody make a scene, trick or treat till the neighbor's gonna die of fright. I am the one hiding under your bed, teeth ground sharp and eyes glowing red. I am the one hiding under your stairs, fingers like snake and spiders in my hair. <laughs> They're gonna like horror movies just like their dad. Isn't is that, that it? Is it? So, sp- yeah, well, it's horror. this is horror movie season, is it not? Somebody emailed us. Um... Speaking of horror, Michael, have you seen 2003's Hot Tension? I think you have, but if you haven't, you're welcome. So no, I haven't, but I Googled it, and this is the response. I mean, this is the uh, description of the movie. Best friends Marie and Alexia decide to spend a quiet weekend at Alexia's parents' secluded farmhouse. Boom, I'm in. That's all I need. Okay, can I just, uh, because I feel like you see a new horror movie every week. How did it get so the only new movies anymore are horror movies? Because they like make money. A, I guess so. I'm, I'm just surprised that was the genre that stuck around. 
Because um, they don't they don't do rom coms anymore. They don't do. You and then, know, well, because they're doing they're doing all the the remakes. So they did Candyman last yeah. year, which I liked. They did it, which I loved, and they just did Hellraiser, which uh, so those three movies were too scary for me as a child. Candyman, It, and Hellraiser were way too scary for me as a child. Hellraiser was like, you remember the cover of that movie, of the of the box when you went to Blockbuster? It was just Pinhead? Yeah. I, I was afraid to walk down the aisle with that. So I've never seen the original Hellraiser. I tried watching the, the remake, and uh, it's just like not my not my scene. Don't love it. Um, I think it's on Hulu maybe. Uh, yeah, too, just too dark for me. So I watched the, I watched the last Halloween. So... They started doing the the most recent Halloween in 2018, which I There's really There's been like liked. 32 of these movies. So Danny McBride is one of the writers. David Gordon Green, I believe, is the director. So the 2018 one was very good. And then they did Halloween Kills, which I remember talking about on this podcast. It was very bad. And Halloween Ends was awful. And listen, I wasn't expecting much, but it's a kind of shocking how bad it was. You're the audience for this movie. I, I'm, I am the audience. Well, Stephen King apparently liked it. He said, I enjoyed Halloween Ends. It doesn't reinvent the wheel, but it's gasp, surprisingly character-driven. It stunk. I hated it. Hated it, does hated it, hated does, it. Does it ever change your mind about someone when they really like what you think is a bad movie? Uh, I mean, it's like, just I've seen some. I've seen some takes from Quentin Tarantino before where I'm like, oh, man, I don't agree with that at all. I guess yeah, each their own. it's just, like, objectively terrible. Um, but I guess, I guess it's not objective, right? Because it's just my opinion. But it was really bad. Disappointing. All right. We're gonna wrap it up. Um, I gotta call the uh, I gotta call the courthouse and make sure that I am okay. A little bit nervous. Right. You can come back with me, and if you want to be on the lam in my in Michigan, I'll I'll take you to a place that has a really good long john. <laughs> All right, animal spirits. Thanks for listening. Pod. You got it, Ben. You can you can wrap it up. Animal spirits pod at gmail.com. We'll talk to you next time. Oh,